This video contains subject matter that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are the type to require a warning throughout a video or show, let this huh? message serve as your warning. This channel discusses the harsh reality of true crime. If this warning is not sufficient for you, consider a different genre and unsubscribe from my channel immediately. And some of you, you make shit up. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? I got your uh, email, Danielle, about the notebook. I uh, got that. Looks like Kathy Chapin's still the super freak from earlier in the day. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still hatless. I've been hatless for five days. Thanks for noticing today. <laughs> I guess that's good though, right? I mean, nobody noticed. Just trying to, I don't know, I just had hat on my head for so long. It felt like, uh, what are you doing, Chloe? Like eating something. You know what's weird? When you go outside when it's sunny and you put the, uh, you let the dog on their back and you rub their belly. You just I just flip them over and go like this and they just immediately go. I mean, blue just goes out cold. Almost like a shark when you flip it over and rub its belly, they just <laughs> I mean he literally just uh his eyes close immediately and he just almost uh, falls asleep. Especially when it's sunny, not when it's any other weather, it's just when it's sunny. It's weird. <clears throat> But anyways, uh, you see the stream goal up at the top there, and uh, if you, there's only a, a thousand and two. I think for every dollar, it's 150 hit points off. There's a thousand two left on Kathy Chapin from earlier, and then the stream goals. Uh, you know, I have it set at less than what I normally try to get. So I mean, that's the number on the screen. There you go. So you guys can look at it, and and uh, you know. See if you can make it happen. If not, I'm still doing the show. <laughs> and with that, okay. <laughs> All right, okay, excellent. No, I guess not. I got. I just bought a weed eater again today. It's better than the one we. The batteries now are about a thousand times better. So, yeah. Yeah, I found this old case. I don't know where. I think it was randomly newspapers.com or something. I don't remember exactly. That uh, the servant girl annihilator. It's gonna be sort of an old school show where I'm reading a lot, and we all know what that means. Okay, so we can kind of keep that from happening. Let's see. Well, hey, what? What? You got any uh, good news on your uh, situation, Amber, with your surgery on your mouth, your jaw? Anything? That sucks. Okay, one, one thing regarding the um, Brian Laundry cases that that JB guy from WFLA said during our stream, Laundry's attorney Steve Bertolino texted me saying, "Roberta's letter, that letter that we read." was in the possession of the FBI for weeks before Brian's remains were discovered. So that means Brian didn't have the... It wasn't with him when his body was found. 
Petito's attorney, Pat Riley, uh, Riley, Riley, previously told me the letter was found in Brian's backpack near the remains. So, hmm. I mean, did they find his backpack way before or something? Who knows, right? Who knows? Uh, we uh, right currently though I'm just gonna our update is we're 26 days until the final day of the month and uh, you know we're doing pretty well for the monthly goal I'm gonna try to get back on to a bigger number this month been working really hard doing two different shows so uh, for those who are just showing up that don't know every night on the channel we have the goal at the top of the screen on the upper left and then there's a super freak uh, in the upper right there where once you beat the person oh there you go there's i guess uh, right there the dobby smith took some points away i think there's 500 points if you become a channel member and so that happened and there you go that's what we do So I don't know what that really means. What do you guys think is more weird in that one? That, uh, let's see, that Roberta would give that same letter to the FBI when, you know, when you read it, it doesn't necessarily help find him. It's sort of what she, she wrote to him, so I'm not really sure, but did the FBI just collect that? Don't really know, or is it weird that, I mean, the other situation where Brian, if the letter was found with Brian, why would he not burn it like she said? It doesn't, it's just weird. So the whole thing, the, no matter how you look at it, whatever attorney's correct, it doesn't look right. I know. Why would the FBI say it was in his backpack? Well, did they say it was in his backpack, or was that his... The attorney said that. I mean, I don't remember who said that. Because <laughs> uh, where the, the JB information says that Brian Laundrie's attorney said that they gave it to him weeks ago, and then the attorney for Petito's family said, oh, it was in the backpack. So I don't know who actually said that. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa Murphy. Why would the FBI say it was in his backpack? I just think that whole case is crazy. It is pretty crazy. Yeah, I mean, it could be that the FBI said it. I don't remember who was saying that stuff a long time ago. And then Brian Enton on Twitter said, Stroud Area Regional Police Department in Pennsylvania released a statement saying there is no evidence that Dana Smithers' case is connected to Brian Koberger. Hey, thanks, Crime Freak. Oh, look at Kathy. Oh, okay, I got to update Time that. Uh, hold on a second. Hit that like button for you. Heart, thumbs up. Here, hold on one second. I got to fix the... Uh, The stream boss. There we go. That's who should be up on there right now. Yeah, is that the right picture though? Let's see. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Colleen, Daily Page, and Cadillac. Okay, so it says, we, uh, we reported yesterday he has a strong alibi. 
Why the grand jury still wanted to question Koberger's parents, we don't know. The Stroud Area Regional Police Department is aware of the many currently reported news articles in which various media outlets have reported connections between uh, Dana Smithers' missing person investigation and Idaho murder suspect Brian Koberger. Hmm. Well, uh, I guess it could be as simple as... No, I guess it turned out where it was like an internet sleuth alerted the family. So I wonder if it was internet sleuth alerted the family of missing Pennsylvania woman that Idaho murder suspect Brian Koberger's parents lived in the same area. So did they just sort of get wind of this? Uh, grand juries can investigate. They can actually ask questions and want to get answers. So there could have just been some people on there that were curious. Like, oh, wow. Hey, I wonder if... Brian Koberger uh, has something to do with this murder. Let's talk to his parents. And I think it could be as simple as that, that they were just out investigating, uh, doing what they want to do, and that's one of the things they wanted to do, the grand jury, and maybe it led nowhere. You would think, though, some, uh, you know, the, what's interesting, though, is the grand jury, I think, was impaneled for her case. So how did that... I don't know. It's a weird one. It's a weird one. Yeah, I know, Cindy. We talked about that last night. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, thanks for repeating it, though. Yes, yes. Yeah. Now, we went over the whole case last night with the maps and everything. It was pretty strange. Uh, Dana, uh, I think Dana was went to a bar right in their little neighborhood there with their husband or ex-husband and her child to some sort of fair then they went back home and then after they got back home she walked over to her other friend's house and then she left that friend's house at 11 sort of looking like she's peering around corners and so forth and then she's never been seen she'd never been seen again until may 1st when her body was discovered not too far away again from her house on an on-ramp, early on an on-ramp. I mean, literally like a clover leaf at the start of the on-ramp. Love time. I don't know what that means, Cindy. Got to type using real words, you know. Hey, Jan H. How's it going? Maybe. We don't know if somebody's watching for her outside or not. But it makes you wonder if she was... Yeah, I don't mean... I mean, she does disappear right then. It's, it looks like she may have made it home based on having all her stuff there, but she just would have walked over to her friend's house maybe with nothing. She did have something in her hand. looked like her phone. Um, so if her phone was found at home, then that means she made it home. Did she then go out again later? Maybe she went to walk back over to that bar again or something. Who the hell knows, right? It has now emerged that Smithers' sister, Stacy Ann, posted to her Facebook page, Finding Dana, on January 2nd, thanking those who had been reaching out recently regarding the possibility of the suspect in the hurry. So maybe the sister was communicated with the grand jury and said that. Yeah. So you wonder if maybe they talked to the sister on the grand jury, and then uh, the sister says, "Wow, there's these people sending me these posts about maybe Koberger. He was in the area." And then they're like, "Oh shit, let's talk to the parents, the grand jury." Although you, I don't know, it just feels like there's got to be a little bit more to it than just wild speculation like that. You, I don't think you're allowed to do that without something. You know, just sort of a willy-nilly, hey, let's go check the the Koberger's family. Uh, just because it sounds like they're dodgy. I don't know, man. Let's do it. Just doesn't make a, a lot of sense. I don't know what he's using. I don't know. 
by the time I get off of it, I don't even want to do this one. It's boring. Anyways, they said there's no evidence linking him at this time. Maybe there will be later. I don't know. Uh, but I'm not going to sit there and... The only thing to speculate on is why they interviewed the parents and we don't get to know the answer to that. So uh, we can sit here all day and be like, hey, maybe this guy named Jim called on a telephone and then talked to one of them and said, hey, have you looked in the Coburger? Yeah, we, oh yeah, yeah, Jim. Well, I thought it was a guy named Bob, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe, Jessica. Lots of maybes out there. Could have been beamed down by a spacecraft. Uh, we don't know. The daughter, uh, younger daughter, was likely at home. Maybe one of the older kids was taking care of babysitting. We don't really know. I don't know if we ever get to know the details. But anyways, I'm going to move on. I got to do I want to do something kind of an old school show. I'm going to do this one. This is the oldest one I've ever done. All right, might take a while to get through this one, but uh I'm going to give it a shot. <laughs> it's crazy. All right. So it's called the Servant Girl Annihilator. And it could be the first um, yeah, Daniel. Just try not to look stuff up when I'm before I do the show because people like to jump in and you know. the uh, Serving Girl Annihilator from Austin, Texas, from 1885. What do you think of that, huh? And they put everything in the papers. That's the best part about it. Yeah, you, you just typed in 1885. Why'd you type it in again? <laughs> just unreal, man. Uh, okay, so here's the... there. There's... Let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. There's eight murders here. And uh, this all took place right around 1985 in Austin, Texas between January... Or actually, the first one was right at the very end of 1984, and then uh, all the way into the end of 1985. Almost like a, exactly a one-year span. Uh, hey, thanks, Jessica Schubach. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it says on the title, 19, or 1885, right? I mean, that's, there were still, that was, that's cowboy days, you know? Like, it's really crazy. You know what I think, though, everybody? I think there's been serial killers uh, since, you know, modern man. So what are the dogs doing over here? Yeah, they're, they're going nuts. Hold on. Old school shows underscore basic generous. Poor blue. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hold on, we gotta we gotta we gotta check this one out. Hold on. What is she gonna do? <laughs> Get it, Chloe. <laughs> Come on, that's like the cutest thing you've ever seen right there. Come on, hello. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Chloe, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, man, that was crazy. All right, anyways. Poor Blue, you know, you got to feel bad for Blue. All right, this first one, the date is actually in eight, 1884. This newspaper article is from January 1st. Um, 
1885. So, I mean, I mean, technically the first murder was in right at the end of 1884. The last one was right at the end of 1885. But man, look, look at the titles and everything. And one of the part that's, you know, it's unfortunate is they refer to black people using, you know, different words that we don't use any, they're, you know, they're racist words now, but at the time they were just like what they used. Um, or they're, they're, I don't know if they're, some of the words they're using are just more like, um, not appropriate now. They're not the one, they're not, it's not like the really, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't even know how to speak to that topic, but you can see. So it's like a black woman killed out, but they use a different word. So here it is. Bloody work. A fearful midnight murder on West Pecan uh, mystery and crime. A black woman killed outright and her lover almost done for. No clue to the perpetrator of the bloody something uh, details of the crime. At uh, a late hour Tuesday night, and if I'm actually reading and I accidentally say one of the words that they have in there, I, that, you know, I apologize. But they use these words sort of often. I'll try to catch them every single time. Uh, at a late hour, Tuesday night, there occurred one of the most horrible murders that ever, report, that ever a reporter was called on to chronicle. A deed almost unparalleled in the atrocity of its execution. It happened on the premise of Mr. W.K. Hall, an insurance man, uh, let's see, lately from Galveston, residing at 901 West Pecan. So I think it's now, it's um, Austin, Texas. Well, they were, they were just speak uh, right the way they felt at the time. Uh, they, this, uh, they, I guess this was pretty savage. I think it was with like an axe or something. Let's see, 901 West. I think it's now it's 6th Street. Okay, right there. I had it pretty close. And this is Molly Smith. That's right. And the, the description was there's a creek over here on the Iron Bridge. Like, I think this bridge going over this creek has been there the whole time. But anyways, 901 West Pecan, about a block beyond the Iron Bridge, there you go, that spans Shoal Creek. Isn't that awesome? I mean, look at that. This bridge right here, apparently, had been here this entire time. So you just go right here. This is probably an iron bridge, and then a block past it over there was the place where she was killed. Hey, thank you, Vanessa Dance. Uh, let's see, a bridge spans Shoal Creek. A black woman named Molly Smith had been in the service of the family, so she was like a maid, right, as, as a cook, or I guess a cook, for a little over a month. So that's why I say servant. A young black fellow, let's see, wander, let's see, wandered or fellow named, no, no. A black fellow named Walter Spencer has been coming to see her for some months, and the couple, though not married, were lately living in living in the relation of man and wife. Between three and four o'clock Wednesday morning, so four in the morning. Uh, it's on my other computer. Oh, that's funny. Let me get a different screen up here. Okay. 
Yeah, the it would have showed up on this screen, but it didn't on the other one. But you could hear it in the background, right? Because it was on my other p computer that I used for the day streams. So a young uh, black man named Walter Spencer has been coming to see her for some months, and the couple, though not married, were literally lying in relation of a man and wife. Lately, living in relation as man and wife. So they were living together. Between 3 and 4 a.m. Wednesday morning, Mrs. Uh, Thos Chalmers, a brother of Mrs. Hall, and Mr. That's, so that's the house of the Hall. So the, the, she was, uh, Molly Smith was a servant at the Hall's resident. And then right here it says, the brother of Mrs. Hall was aroused from sleep Oh, excuse me, let's see. Between 3 and 4 Wednesday morning, Mrs. Thos Chalmers, a brother... Oh, so Mr. Thos Chalmers, it's hard to read with all this crap on the screen. A brother of Mrs. Hall was aroused from sleep by the entrance of Spencer. He was bleeding freely from several wounds on the head and said, Mr. Tom, for God's sakes, do something to help me. Somebody has nearly killed me. Young Chalmers at once sprang up and, st striking a light, saw that the black man was badly hurt. He could tell, uh, let's see, he could tell nothing of the occurrence and did not know who hit him. He and the woman above mentioned had been occupying a small apartment in the rear of the house, just back of the kitchen. He remarked that Molly was gone. Chalmers told him to go to the doctors and get his wounds dressed. He wouldn't leave the house to go with them, owing to the sickness of one of the inmates. Spencer then went away. At break, la uh, uh, let's see, what is this? Spencer then went away at break at breakfast time. <laughs> God, it's hard to read it. It's kind of I don't know what the deal is, but it's just my eyes can't see it as good as I'd like to. See, in uh, Austin, Texas. At breakfast time yesterday morning, Molly was missing, but even then nobody was aware of her terrible fate. It was perhaps about 9 o'clock a.m. when a servant in the, in the employ of a neighbor observed a strange-looking object in the backyard of the hall residence. He and... Once report, he, had once, he at once reported the matter, and several hurried to the spot. There lay the woman, a ghastly object to behold, a horrible hole in the side of her head told the tale. The reason she had not been discovered earlier was that she lay immediately behind a small outhouse, and no one thought of looking for her there. From the outhouse to the room, there was... Uh, where she slept was about 50 steps, so the unfortunate victim of the brutal attack had been dragged to the spot where her dead body was found. All the circumstances go to show that the murder was committed in the room where the two were sleeping. Later in the day, a statesman, uh, let's see, a statesman man repaired to the repaired to the scene of the tragedy. He was. Uh, let's see. First shown the woman still lying in this yard, but a brief glance at the sickening sight was sufficient. She was a, let's see, like light-colored mulatto something, apparently about 25 years of age. A distinct trail on the ground leading to her door showed where the inhumane fiend had dragged her. She was nearly nude, when first discovered inside the room, there were evidences of a desperate struggle, a broken looking glass, uh, disarranged furniture, and bloody finger marks on the door showed that a fight for her life, silent and unseen, saved by the principles but uh, obstinate to the end, had taken place. The pillow and sheets were bathed in blood and sanguinary stains were all over the floor. Besides the foot of the bed lay an axe, beyond doubt the instrument of the crime, as it too was bloodstained. Who used it? 
There lies the mystery. Did the man and woman engage in a fight between themselves, and did he slay her? That's one theory. It is only a theory. There is nothing in particular to make it plausible. The, kind, the kindest relations had previously existed between them. No difficulty had occurred to break off an intimacy that had lasted for months. Why should either want to murder the other? The other theory binges on the arrest, or hinges on, I think it looks like binges, but it uh, it's probably hinges on the arrest of William Brooks, a young black man who, who uh, employed as a bartender in the Barrel House Saloon on East Pecan. Brooks was a former lover of Molly and had known her in Waco before she, be, she came to Austin. This other theory supposed jealousy on the part he was put in the county jail in the forenoon on suspicion late in the afternoon. You know, it's kind of weird to be able to, you know, <laughs> I mean, they do speak English, but it's so long ago. It's you know, easily understandable. They use a little, uh, better language than we do now, you know. I knew her in Waco and have nothing to do with her here. I am innocent of the murder and can prove it by the number of witnesses that I was at a ball on Stand Hill near the Tillotson Institute till four o'clock in the morning and was the prompt and was the prompter, whatever that is. They've got hold of the wrong man. Going to the house where Brooks said he went after leaving the ball in an alley back of Dr. Wright's church, the reporter asked the black woman living there at what hour Brooks came in. So you look at like the reporters did the investigation. Between two and three o'clock in, in the night, she answered. Are you certain that uh, that was asked? Yes, sir, I am, I am, because after he had come in and slept a while, I woke up and happened to look at the clock, noticed it was just three. It will be remembered that Brooks said it was 4 a.m. when he left the ball and the place was fully a mile and a half distant and would have been at least 20 minutes past four uh, before he got to the room. Yeah, so anyways, I'm just gonna, let's see, the wounded man was next called on. Hey, thank you, scout and dude. He was in a uh, pitiable plight, but was able to speak, though with a somewhat indistinct utterance. There were five facial hurts the most serious one being a puncture under the eye fractured the orbital bone. Dr. Burt, the city physician, had found a part of the bone pressed back in, into the cavity against the eyeball Jesus, and had pulled it forward into place. Though badly hurt, the doctor thinks the chances of recovery are favorable. His statement was made in a clear way as follows. It was some time between... Nine and ten o'clock Tuesday night, but I went to Molly's room. She complained of being sick and asked me if I wasn't sorry, if I wasn't sorry for her. She also told me to wake her up early the next morning. I don't remember anything else that happened. Hey, Cadillac! Thank you so much. Isn't it crazy, all the details they have in here? I mean, there's no way you get any anything like this back. I mean, it's pretty crazy. Uh, so I don't know who did it, but it, was, it wasn't Molly. I don't know who did it, but it wasn't Molly. Oh, yeah, so he's saying Molly wasn't the one who hit me. I thought somebody had killed me. Molly was not in the room, and I never saw her anymore. I went around in front of the house woke Mr. Chalmers and told him what happened. He told me uh, to go to the doctor. I went out the back way and noticed that the gate was wide open, though I recollected having fastened it. I first went to the house of a black man living near, and he gave me a coat. Then I went to see Dr. Ralph Steiner, who washed and dressed my wound. I then went back to Mr. Hall's and found the front gate open. Then I started, uh, let's see, started up uh, uptown, but 
was so weak that I fell down several times before getting to my brother's restaurant on Brazos Street, Newton Saloon. It was about six o'clock in the morning when I got there. Oh, whoa. <laughs> Thank you, Cali Gal 3. Anyways, I appreciate uh, you guys' support. I really do. Yeah. Every, all of you. I mean, you know, it's all the same. You know, if 10 people send in five, it's 50, right? <laughs> it's the same thing. It's all the same. I appreciate everybody. It all makes a huge difference. Every single person that sends in something here, some of that will be being used to. Like I say, I mean, I, you get an income here and a big portion of it gets sent off to it, uh, charities out there. And we even have our own website now on Nickmec they made for us because we've given them over $21,000. What do you think of that? Can I get a boom? <laughs> Anyways, uh, th th these, are, these are crazy stories. So really, get, you can picture it. I then went back to Mr. Hall's and found the front gate open. Then I started uptown, but was so weak that I fell down several times before getting to my brother's restaurant on Brazo Street. It was about six o'clock in the morning when I got there, and he had me uh, he had me taken home in a in a hack. I don't know what that means. I have no quarrel with anybody, but Brooks. Some three months ago, he wanted to fight me. He had stayed with Molly in Waco, but I don't say that he was the one. I don't know who did it, but anybody could have got into the room easily through the door, connecting it with the kitchen. There are uh, these are about the facts, and the reader is left to draw his own conclusion, whether slain by her lover or some party from the outside is yet a mystery. Yeah, so they thought maybe it was the, uh, the what is it, like ex-husband or boyfriend or something like that from Waco. But, you know, it sounds like it was right in the middle of the night. Like they were sleeping. It, uh, very similar to the one that we did on the uh, scene of the crime with Morph in them. I mean, it was, uh, we did a story, it was like a, an axe murder in a hotel and they were basically sleeping when the person came in. Okay. So that was Molly Smith and that was so when they say Tuesday night, Thursday, so it would have been uh, December 30th is when she was murdered. And it's, 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 it's really weird because the last murder, guess what date that one was? I think it was December 30th, uh, 1985, 1885. I mean, I can't imagine that being a coincidence. I mean, really? Exactly a year later is the last one. But anyways, the second murder is Eliza Shelley. One of the things that was kind of cool, I was trying to do research to figure out what Pecan Street was, and I found this. It said, located in the heart of downtown, the 6th Street Historic District has become a symbol of Austin's unique culture, vitality, and diversity. Formerly known as Pecan, Pecan Street, the historic avenue appeared on Edwin Waller's first maps of Austin in early, as early as 1839. So now 6th Street is, is called 6th Street, where it was Pecan Street back then. And obviously, uh, you know, there was probably a, houses here. I mean, it didn't look like that. <laughs> It's probably completely, this whole area was mostly homes, I'm sure, back then, and maybe saloons and a few stores. And then over the years, you know, the city builds and people move out of the area or get removed. And, you know, some of these homes here might be really old. I mean, you can even, I bet you some of these homes are historic houses just by looking at them. Let's see. 
Yeah, I mean, a house like that, that could have been built at the turn of the century right there. And it looks like they're doing restoration work on this one. These are, man, those are amazing though. <laughs> could you imagine living in one of those? Anyways, hold on, my wife just came out. I'll, I'll keep going. I got moving on to the next one just in a second. Sorry about that. Thanks for waiting around, everybody. All right, now we're moving on to the next. Now, you can sort of see the sort of um, racial disparity. Like when they, later on in here, they do this. I, I think six victims are black and two are white. And later on, they give out, uh, what is it called? Um, they do rewards. And there's like, a different reward for each of the white women and then one reward for all six of the black women see how shitty that is <laughs> I mean it's just ridiculous you know, so. anyways uh, and there's I, I could only find pictures of the two white women that were killed in the newspapers yeah I mean this is 18 something not too many years after they, they abolished slavery so. <clears throat> so this is May 8th right here and this one says the foul fiends <laughs> their, their titles are crazy don't you think I mean, the foul fiends keep up their wicked work another woman cruelly murdered at, de at dead of night by some unknown assassin bent on plunder another deed of uh, diviltry in the crimson catalog of crime <laughs> these guys are crazy when dr lb johnson a well-known citizen of this city went to the market yesterday morning about six o'clock his usual time he had no idea of a terrible tragedy that had been enacted on his own premises the doctor lives in a neat cottage on the corner of San uh, Jacinto and Cypress Streets. So let's see if that's still there. Thank you, Eugenie. San, yeah, yeah, Jacinto and Cypress Street. Yeah, wow, that's weird, it's still there. So that's close, you know, that one was right there. Uh, just put a pin here. Now there's no homes there anymore, so. And this is Eliza Shelley. Uh, let's see, the central railway track being immediately in front of the house. Let's see if that's still there. Doesn't look like it. No more railroad railroad track there anymore. So. Uh, some forty or fifty steps in the rear stood a small cabin with one room with an alley behind and facing towards the residence of Dr. Johnson, from which it was separate separated by a high fence with a gate between. This cabin was on the doctor's premises and occupied by a black woman named Eliza Shelley and her three small children. The woman was employed by him as a cook 
and had been in the service of the family a long time. On returning home, he observed an unusual commotion, and before entering the house, heard his wife exclaim, I believe Eliza has been murdered. It was so. While the gentleman was absent, his lady's attention was directed to shrill screams coming from the cook's room and sent her little niece out to inquire. Really? Jeez. <laughs> the cause. Really? You're going to send your niece out to go check on a scream? Uh, the little girl came back pale and excited. She had only taken a brief look at the room, but that glance revealed such an awful sight that the messenger dared not enter, but ran quickly back. Her aunt had the same experience. They told the doctor that they had seen and heard and hurriedly going out, he pushed open the door to view a most ghastly sight. Stretched on the floor lay the poor woman, quite dead, with a gaping wound over her right eye, fully two inches long and nearly that wide. It was done with some sharp instrument, probably a hatchet, which cleft through the skull to the brain. It was necessarily fatal and must have produced almost instant death. There were several, let's see, there were several minor wounds that must have been done with some other weapon. There was a deep round hole just over the ear and another between the eyes, both produced with some sharp instrument. Jesus. Uh, the pillows and sheets were saturated with blood and the room was in great disorder. Two trunks had been broken open and their contents scattered on the floor. Uh, after the killing, the murderer, dragging the victim from the bed and placing her on a lot of patchwork taken out of the trunk, took the white counterpane off the bed and deliberately wrapped it around the body. It was the coolness of a fiend. There was nothing found in the apartment that might serve as a means of discovering the perpetrator. No hatchet. The bar or any piece of the iron or steel that could have done those bloody work, that bloody work. Only one thing was discovered by Dr. Johnson, and that was the track of barefooted man leading up the alley to her room and returning. The soil is sandy, and the footprints were plainly marked. The, the impress on the sand revealed the fact that the foot was short and broad. Isn't that crazy, the, the uh, information that's in these? It's wild, isn't it? Let's see. Child story. Uh, Lisa had three little boys, all of whom occupied the same bed with her. The eldest is some eight years old but did not appear to statesman reporter who questioned him to be larger, an average, uh, larger than an average boy of six. The poor little fellow had a rather dazed look which was but natural in view of the sad surroundings. He was also excited over the great crowds. Isn't that, you know what's weird about the story like this? Is the children that we're talking about here, these little kids, they died probably... 60 years ago. I mean, it's like this story, you know, uh, 1988, 1985, they, they're, none of these people are even close to alive. I and mean, I would imagine that they probably died in 1960, the, the kids that we're talking about, or even before. He was also excited over the great crowds of people, mostly black people, who had from early in the morning been visiting the spot and he also had to answer the same set of questions to a jury of inquest. Oh, my stomach just made a sound. So it's required some a little time to get him to talk. He however replied intelligently to such questions as were put to him and his account was in, uh, in substance as follows. So here, let's see what this says. Uh, 
A man came into the room and asked me where my mother kept her money. I told him I didn't know. He told me to cover up my head. If I didn't, he would kill me. The man said he was going to St. Louis the next morning. The boy at times seemed bewildered slightly and had no clear idea as to whether the man was white or black. He told Mrs. Johnson that he, meaning the murder, said he was white. He said also that he wrote a, uh, let's see, that he wore a white rag over his face. Hmm. He replied in answer to a question put by the reporter that he didn't know that anything had happened to his mother in the night and that after the man left, he went to sleep again. Picture the idea of those three little unfortunates quietly sleeping while their murdered mother lay stretched out on the floor beside them dead. It was a terrible revelation that the daylight or a light brought to them. The other children were too small to tell anything about the matter if indeed they knew. Dr. Johnson was found and said he was willing to do everything in his power to aid in unraveling the mystery of the murder. He knew of no motive for the killing. Though the woman had no money unless a few paltry cents that she might have saved from her wages, Eliza had formerly lived in the, in the country where she also was in service and was an excellent woman. She had a husband in the penitentiary to whom she was greatly attached she never had company in her cabin that he, uh, that he or any of the family knew of. The doctor's wife also testified to the good character of the deceased. The murdered woman was about 30 years old and medium size and of unmixed uh, African blood. I mean, I don't know why it matters, but back then, you know, it was a little bit more... I mean, it doesn't sound, you know, the way they write, it's, you know, they seem more caring, but that's just the wording they used back then. So, wish there was a, you know, better way to write it, but I don't, I can't sit here and redo the whole thing. I'm just trying to catch all of the words that they say that they, we don't use anymore. Thank you, Scouting Dude. And thanks for the email today. Uh, it was curious to note the different opinions as to the kind of instrument employed. Some thought the wounds were inflicted by a sharp edge tool like a hatchet or axe. Others uh, that they were too jagged and uneven for that. And then it was done by some blunter <coughs> weapon. But whatever it was used, not a piece was left to tell the tale. Late in the afternoon, Deputy Sheriff John Holmes arrested one Andrew Williams said to be half-witted uh, black boy about 19 years old at the residence of a black woman living near the circle rink. He was barefooted at the time, a slender clue perhaps, but one that may lead to important results. The barefooted tracks spoken of above were measured at the time and compare, comparisons were made. The murder was the, let's see, town talk. The murder was the theme of considerable discussion. Let's see. A prominent gentleman remarked that it must be the work of a maniac. It's funny how serial killers are basically referred to as sex fiends and maniacs. I didn't realize it even went back that far, but like in the 50s, you know, you see that. There's a maniac running around. Well, those are serial killers. I think serial killers have been around since the dawn of man, uh, really. I mean, why would, why would there all of a sudden be some? They just, nobody thought of it like that before. I mean, I'm talking about, I don't know, you know, if you go back 30,000 years or whatever, but I'm just saying, you well, know, whenever there, there was mass people living in the same area, serial killers have been around. I mean, hell, I wouldn't even doubt if a Neanderthal was a serial killer. So 
Especially since they look so weird. You know, maybe they were a uh, incel. What, what Neanderthal wasn't an incel, huh? Well, other female uh, Neanderthals, I guess, might think uh, comparatively that the the other Neanderthal was cuter than the other Neanderthal. Uh, let's see. <laughs> but when the Homo sapien sapien came in, oh boy, it threw a wrench in there where all the Neanderthal women were looking over at the Homo sapien sapien going, oh my God, look at that guy over there. And then the Neanderthals were like, hey, screw that, man. I'm, yeah. <sighs> yeah, remember that? Mani you weren't alive when they were using Maniac Cadillac. Come on. I guess I don't know how old you are, though. <laughs> Uh, all right, so I'm going to move on to the next one. Let's see, what does it say right here? Round Austin, a complaint against a black named Andrew Williams for the murder. Okay. All right. So that was Eliza Shelley. And then just, uh, shoot, uh, what is it? 16 days. Actually, it's more like 10. 18 days later. Irene Cross, there's another one. It's crazy. One more unfortunate. Irene Cross, death, no clue to the assassin. Saturday morning, paper, uh, paper contained an account of a fearful attack on Irene Cross, a black woman living on East Linden Street, not far from Shoals Garden. So, you know, that Linden Street, I'm not sure. I, I sort of found it, yeah, over here. And then they say Shoals Garden. I don't know if that's still there or not. So, let me try to type it. Yeah. S C H O L Z Garden. See, that says Garten, and that's way over here, so it doesn't really make sense to me. Although this makes more sense, right? Like, that is right near these places. So that says Schulz Garten, you know, but not Schulz Garden like they have. So if anybody wants to, and uh, the thing is, is that other street that they said on East Linden, you know, it's way over here, so it doesn't, and it goes this direction, so I don't see how it could ever run into this. So, I'll, I'll put a pin here, just, you know, I'm sure the city's been ch changed quite a bit over the years. We'll just call this Shoals, and it's spelled the same, S-C-H-O-L-Z, but it was Gardin, not Gartin. So that makes sense compared to these, though. <clears throat> I gotta check something, hold on. Got to look something up. Mm -hmm. All right. Saturday morning, papers contain the account of a fearful attack on Irene Cross, a black woman living on East Linden Street, not far from Shoals Garden. It, it in no wise differed from the regulation outrages practice on the black servant woman of Austin for the last four months. She was sleeping quietly in her own room. I mean, look how similar this is. I mean, all these are exactly the same. She was sleeping quietly in her own room, except some of them have had the other people with them. It's, it's unreal, man. It almost kind of reminds me of um, the East Area Rapist. You know, very kind of strange. We don't know if there's been sexual acts committed on these women, though. For the last four months, she was sleeping quietly in her own room, but had left the door unlocked for her son, who kept late hours. 
The fiend came in. The startled woman cried out. He assaulted her with a long, sharp knife, perhaps a razor, and cut a horrible gash in her arm, severing the brachial artery. Another frightful wound was inflicted on her head. Uh, she died yesterday morning between 5 and 6 o'clock. A jury of inquest, impaneled by Justice Von Rosenberg, found the usual verdict of death at the hands of an unknown person. Her death ranks third on the list of black women who have been mysteriously murdered in Austin without a short, uh, within a short period. First was the case of Molly Smith. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, that Asian, maybe? Molly Smith, uh, an Asian girl, maybe, who was killed on West Pecan Street. A black woman named Brooks was arrested and kept a few weeks in jail. There were but slight grounds of connecting him with the crime, and the murder is still a mystery. The next murder occurred, but a few nights ago, the room of Eliza Shelley was entered at dead of night, and the poor creature was brained with a hatchet. A black named Ike Plummer has been arrested on circumstantial evidence and is now in jail. See, all these people were released. None of them were connected later. There is nothing positive against him, although in the opinion of many, he is guilty. Well, of course, yeah. The last, he put it in the paper. Oh, he's guilty. The last murder was equally fiendish, equally as horrible, executed equally as mysterious, as regards its perpetrator as the two proceeding, said a citizen yesterday, a public meeting ought to be called, vigilance committees should be formed, and orders to leave the city uh, instanter should be given to every loafer and vagabond, white or black. This will have a good effect and beyond all doubt ought to be immediately carried out. All right, so that was um, Irene Cross. And then there's kind of a smaller clip here, but it says, a number of black citizens assembled in the courthouse this evening and held a meeting, the object of which was to take uh, some action in regard to the numerous murders that have been committed on their race in this city during the past six months and to prevent it from possibly further violences. A committee of five was appointed to wait on the governor. County officials said a city council that a reward uh, would be offered for the capture of the murder of Mary Ramey. So that's a new person that was murdered. It was also agreed that the Black people would work together and do all in their power to stop the reign of crime. This action on their part is looked on as a good move. Let's hope much good will come of it. Let me let me see if I can find more on that one. Mary Ramey, 1885. <laughs> well, thank you, Cadillac. <laughs> that was very kind of you. Almost got all the way to the the goal. It's one of those miraculous nights again. Thank you so much. That's the one I was meant to say before. 1985, 09, 01, Mary Ramey. Okay, there we go. 
Thank you so much, Cadillac. Really appreciate it. An atrocious crime. Mary Ramey, a black child taken from her bed, vanished, and then killed. So another intruder removing the person. Sunday morning between 4 and 5 o'clock. Hold on, let me check something. Sunday morning between 4 and 5 o'clock, some brute entered the kitchen of Mr. V.O. Weed on East Cedar Street where Rebecca Ramey and her 11-year-old daughter Mary were sleeping and sandbagged Rebecca and dragged the child into the wash house adjoining, ravishing her, and then drove an iron pin into both her ears, killing her. Wow, so there was a sexual element to this one. In short, while the mother, Rebecca, then, when the reporter of the Statesman saw her yesterday, was in much pain, and her, uh, let's see, physish, I don't know how to, how to pronounce that, physician maybe, I don't know, physician thought she was some, uh, some better. She is wounded in the left temple by some sharp instrument, and the physicians are of the opinion that she was also sandbagged cedar yeah yeah it's east cedar austin okay so it's in so it's somewhere on cedar street i mean i don't know how long it goes i mean there's one there, <laughs> but I mean, Austin's probably changed so dramatically since then, we, we don't really know. Don't you guys like these ones though? I, mean, I, I love doing these ones. I know it's sort of slow and you plod through them, but I think they're like, man, it makes you just go, holy shit, uh, I mean, this has been going on for a long time, you know? Thank you, Annie T. Very kind, very kind. <laughs> I mean, Caligal 3 and Annie T and uh, Cadillac and all everybody else, they're always helping on the Daily Show too, so it's pretty pretty amazing. And I appreciate your support. But. All right. Becky states that she went to bed Saturday night at 9 o'clock and heard the clock strike 11, 10 or 11, and after this she remembered nothing more until aroused by the physicians, she says that she didn't recognize the person who committed the awful deed. In fact, that she was asleep when the attack was made and didn't know what had happened until the doctor came to examine her wounds. Well, thanks again, Caligal3. Very kind, very kind. Uh, Sunday morning, Mr. John uh, Shenville, police sergeant and deputy sheriff Harry White and Mr. Wilson, with some bounds, traced a barefooted man from Mr. Weed's yard to uh, Irvin's stables. The hounds ran with their noses to the ground and stopped at the stable. One of the pursuers went on the inside of the stable and arrested Tom Allen, Allen's Feet were measured with the tracks in the sand, and they fitted to a hair, they said. Then it's learned, <laughs> then it is learned that Alan could not give an account of his uh, movements after 2 a.m. on Sunday. It was reported that Alec Mack was implicated, but this report is not credited by the police. Mack was chased by the dogs for several miles, and he was found in... Mason Town, where he had secreted himself when arrested. He had a lot of asophatus tie, I don't know, tied around his feet. The officers asked him what that was for. He said to throw dem hounds off the scent. He was locked up under an old charge. 
wherever that is. Yeah, 16 hours after the fiend in human shape had committed his hellish work at the house of Mr. V.O. Weed, Dr. Burt made an examination of Tom Allen, the supposed murderer. Dr. Burt told a reporter of the Statesman yesterday that the examination proved very conclusively to his mind that Allen was not the man who raped the girl. Well, there you go. I mean, see, uh, they have no idea who this person is at this point. Thank you, Music Maker. I think we're over here, right? Yeah, now I gotta back out to where I was. Okay. Theo Thanks, Weed. Ray. Love your shows. Heart. Well, thank you. Being duly sworn says about 5 this morning a.m. I heard a noise out in the yard and asked my wife. This is his account, the homeowner that had the servant. Heard a noise out in the yard and asked my wife what, what was there. And she said it was a dog howling, but I told her it was an unnatural sound. And I sprang up and went on the back gallery with a lamp in my hand. I then heard a noise in in my kitchen. And it growing worse, I called to my wife, there was nothing wrong, and I got my gun. There was something wrong, and I got my gun. She and I came together on the gallery and found the kitchen door locked. I called Becky repeatedly, um, Okay. So hold. door locked. I called Becky repeatedly but received no answer. I then went to the door of the kitchen and heard a noise in the cabin and and told Lockbrush to hold the lamp and then I pushed the kitchen door open and asked the woman Becky Ramey, What was the matter? She replied, I don't know. I'm sick. I then turned and hollered to William Jacka and told him that I thought my two servants were murdered. Uh, that one was in the kitchen and the other was missing. I'm satisfied that the noise I heard was from a person. As soon as Jack arrived, I got my, jack, my uh, jacket and took the lamp and then went into the cabin and found the girl dying. I then went for John uh, Shenville and his hounds and then awoke Mr. Wilson and told him to bring his hounds as Shenville was waiting for them. When I came back, Dr. Swearingen had arrived. Dr. Swearingen, Mr. Jacka, and myself went into the cabin and found the girl in a dying condition with a small quantity of blood under her head. There was only a small quantity of blood on the floor near the girl when I first saw her, but when I returned, the quantity had increased, so she was bleeding out to five or ten times more so it was really he got there right after uh, they were killed and the person was probably pretty close at that point more than there was the first it is my opinion she had been injured not over a half an hour when I first saw her Rebecca Ramey had no men uh, going to uh, to see her so she wasn't seeing or dating anybody and I think her a good and Virtuous woman. The girl Mary was about 11 years of age. Yeah, so Mary Ramey's the one that was uh, being a sworn says, I was called this morning before day by Mr. Weed. He stating that both of his servants had been attacked and would die and would die, that he wanted me to come up as quick as I could. I found Dr. Swearingen there there and we examined the wounds of both mother and daughter the mother was in the kitchen and the daughter was in the wash house we examined the girl first and she was still alive the girl was evidently struck by some sharp instrument in both ears and we probed the ears and found that the wounds were deep cutting uh we examined the girl first where where did that go deep cutting a portion of her ears she had been ravished 
and so raped basically and and considerably torn she had evidently been struck with a sandbag or something of that kind after which she had been ravished and killed we then examined the mother she had been ravished but had been struck and stunned the same way as the girl and wouldn't that be crazy if you could exhume one of these women girls that are you know both these victims i mean i think one of them lived though so marry anyways and somehow retrieve ancient dna from being assaulted and then attribute it to somebody <laughs> wouldn't that be absolutely crazy someday that's going to happen somebody is going to figure out what happened here let's see we then examine the mother she had not been ravished she had not been ravished the mother but had been struck and stunned the same way as the girl and had two cuts on the left side of her head i think that the skull is fractured the girl lived about one hour after i arrived living next door to the scene of the atrocities was a sworn and testified as follows i heard a voice calling me and i went out on my gallery when i went through the fence i saw mr weed have a double-barreled gun in his hands he said that someone had killed both of his servants he thought one of them was dragged off i then dressed myself and went over to mr weed's house we found the woman rebecca ramey on her hands and knees groaning she had blood on her head mr weed said let's go to the the outhouse with the light I carried the light and Mr. Weed pushed the door out, uh, the door of the outhouse open with the muzzle of his gun. We saw the girl lying on the floor as I, su as I suppose dead. I did not go to her. There was no one else in the room. I told Mr. Weed he had uh, best get the bloodhounds. He went off and requested me to watch the back gate and allow no one to come in or out in about let's see 15 minutes two policemen came well that's <laughs> 15 minutes that's really fast uh even in today's standard right i mean and these guys were what on horseback or something and there's no phones really so let's see uh, get the bloodhounds we went off and requested me to watch the back gate and allow no one to come in about 15 minutes two policemen came when the hounds came we began looking for tracks and found some some that looked as if they had been made by bare feet the dogs went into the alley and went to my alley gate and found there the same tracks leading into my yard and the gate was open the tracks led into my yard and then out again owing to the dampness of the ground the tracks were very plain the man with the hounds then told me he followed the tracks to mr evans stable i then went with him and saw the same tracks in mr evans yard and traced them from the gate towards the house <laughs> Have you ever heard this kind of detail in anything? I mean, uh, Dr. Swearingen said, I was called about 5 a.m. August 30th. To, I mean, this is almost like the police report being in the newspaper. It's crazy. I was called at about 5 a.m. August 30th to Mr. V.O. Weeds and found Mary Ramey in a dying condition and remained with her until death occurred about one hour after, afterward. The cause of death was wounds inflicted by a sharp pointed instrument penetrating the brain. From the fresh appearance of the blood, I would think the injuries had not been done more than one or two hours before my arrival. I think it was done almost immediately uh, when they ran over there because that pool of blood was growing and it grew really fast in a short amount of time. That means the wound had just occurred, most likely anyways. So, anyways, uh, there we go. That was uh, the ah oh, shoot. I put I gotta put, change the date for future reference here. 
labeled it 1985. Okay, so then, then we already read that where the town's starting to go, hey, uh, let's start doing something about that. That was the first article I read on Mary Ramey. Now, the, now we're moving on to Grace Vance. And this is, so we've got, uh, it was, Ramey was September 1st, and this one is September 29th, the same month. So this person is really going pretty quick here. Uh, to the front again, four horrible midnight murders committed in Austin. Uh, so now we got Grace Vance down here. On the criminal record of Austin under the heading of murder another and more horrible, more hideous than the preceding ones is this morning recorded notwithstanding the uh, indication of the citizens, the action of the city council and the combined efforts of the black people to check the reign of crime in the capital of the murderous fiend arrived with his favorite and none the and um was it something nunless or mo something weapon and an axe or hatchet went uh, coolly quietly and determined last night to a cabin coupled by a black man and a black woman and in a determined and businesslike way sent his weapon crushing into the skull of the victim which were uh, as has been before servant uh, before servant girls his inhuman hellish craze where is that yeah it's hard to get through this it's so hard to read it you guys can see I mean you might be able to read it pretty good from a distance like that but <clears throat> Yeah, in the human and hellish. Okay, there you go. Uh, being quenched with the slaughter, he dragged one of the dying women from his house through a window, over a fence, and across a vacant lot to a thickly weeded spot, and there um, outraged her and pounded her head into a shapeless mass with a brick. This scene of this... Uh, sicken tragedy was at uh, let's see 21 I hope that I think that says 2108 let's see if we can find that 2108 Guadalupe oh that's well, still there look at that now oh, we're getting right back into the middle of it all here look at this Yeah, see, now you're back in this area. And that's not a house anymore, but that's where it was. Now, let's see if it was 24. It could also be 2408. And then let's see if that's a house. No, let's go with the 21. is uh, Grace Vance. Uh, so man, this person was crazy. He pulled him over a fence and kept moving him around. I mean, that's crazy. The, uh, the scene of the uh, sick and tragedy was at 2108 Guadalupe Street, which is a small cottage facing west, situated in the middle of the block about 25 feet back from the street, just in the rear of the left side of the cottage, in a small uh, shanty about 12 to 10 feet in size, containing only one room. To the north of these premises are 
several unfenced vacant lots. The cottage is occupied by W.D. Dunham, editor of the Texas Court Reporter, and his family. The shanty in the rear is where the servants slept and where the slaughter took place. It was occupied last night by Orange Washington, his wife, so by Orange Washington, his wife, known as Great uh, Grace Vance, Patsy Gibson, and Lucinda Dobby. So Orange Washington and so a man. It looks like Orange Washington and Grace Vance were both killed in this one. Uh, let's see. So. From the testimony and surrounding circumstances, it appears that the assassin at about one o'clock in the morning entered the room through a window and before any of the sleepers awoke, he succeeded in striking all four of them on the head. Brian Cober, yeah, see, Brian Cober, see how what you do when people are sleeping? You know, you can get in there and things happen. And this guy's done it in all these cases right here. Seizing Grace Vance, he dragged her through the window, tumbled her. I mean, look how crazy this is. He pounded all these people, right? And then he picked this girl up and dragged her out of a window. I mean, this, this is insane. Over a fence and pulled her through the weeds over the vacant lot to the rear of a stable situated about 75 yards from the room. I mean, stables were all over, the, like garages, basically. They're all over the place situated about 75 yards from the room where he had first knocked her senseless. Thank you, Cadillac. Welcome, Nana B, RLR, Christy Girl, 949 Sherry, and Patricia Aria. Hopefully none of you are trolls, but we'll find a way to weed that out. Thank you very much. At this place, she must have regained consciousness, so she was still alive after being dragged. At this place, she must have regain consciousness as the ground and weeds bear the marks of a death struggle. He, however, overpowered her and battered her head with a brick uh, to a jelly. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I mean, she must have had her head just absolutely pulverized. Uh, her head with a brick to a jelly and apparently while um, while she was struggling between life and death, he, um, he assaulted her sexually. While he was committing this horror, Lucinda Body, uh, Lucinda Body, that's her name actually, B-O-D-D-Y, somewhat recovered from the blows she had received and regained her strength sufficiently to get up and light a lamp in the cabin. The assassin seeing the light returned and sticking his head through the window. Uh, let's see. Something corralled the girl or something? The woman and offered her to put out the light. At seeing him, she screamed and ran out of the door. He sprang through the window, put out the light, followed and overtook her just as she gained the front gate where a struggle ensued during which time Durham who was awakened by her probably screams or whatever threw open his front door and knowing that the murder had been committed and thinking that the disturbance to be a simple like row whatever that hell that means He was followed in several... Okay, right, where is that? Man has murdered every... He leveled his... Yeah, was it way up here? I mean, I don't even... You, you scroll down. These are so dense. Uh, densely written. Let's see. Yeah, I think it's around in here. And seeing him, she screamed and ran out of the door. He sprang through the window, put out the light, followed and overtook her just as she gained the front gate where a struggle ensued. Um, during which time Mr. Durham, who was awakened by, yeah, it is, I think it does say screams, by her screams, threw open his front door and knowing that murder had been committed 
and thinking the disturbance to be a simple row. He leveled his gun at them with no intention of shooting and ordered them to cease their noise. The woman, by, the, the woman, by a desperate struggle, freed herself from the fiend and running to Mr. Durham, she threw her arms around him and implored for protection, saying the man had murdered everyone in the cabin. Man, that guy could have ended the whole thing right then. Isn't that wild? Now, the murderer ran as soon as the two men ran to Mr. Durham, who at once called to his neighbor for his assistance. This is, you know what's weird? The, the case that keeps popping into my mind is the East Area Rapist. You know, there was a couple different times where, like, people tussled with him. And he went into people's houses at night and then eventually ended up, he started killing people. The murderer ran as soon as the two men ran to Mr. Durham, who at once called his neighbor for assistance to catch the murderer, who was now running towards a mesquite thicket a few blocks back from the house. He was followed by several, uh, what is it, Parent persons, I guess, and some sight shots fired at him. The entire details of the acts resemble very much those of Mary Ramey, murder which occurred here a few weeks ago it is generally believed the same fiends they keep saying fiends did both acts the officer have arrested two black uh, people on suspicion one oliver townsend and doug woody yeah you know, all these people were found to have nothing to do with it so so there's that one and then orange washington was part of the same set here just want to see what how they word this one has that same article structure as the original ones we were looking at. Okay, thanks for looking that up, Danielle. All right, let's see. Uh, slain servants. At an early hour yesterday morning, Long before the average businessman or sprightly housekeeper, we up and about a report was flashing over the city that another murderous assault. So up here, the, oh, come on. <laughs> Nobody knows that a row is an argument. Come on. Slain servant. Monday morning, horrible butchery. Innumerable theories, a great many clues and four arrests a sickening sight at the scene of the murder four persons weltering in their blood <laughs> uh, oh. two of them dead and the others unconscious one rallies but not the, she's an art teacher though okay cool I, i've never heard of it used like that in my entire life i've never heard it but look at lisa did too Oh, come on. Nobody uses that anymore, Plato. There, I, if you read one, point out one recent article that says, hey, there was two people down the street in a row. And you're going to go, oh, that was, they were in a fight. Give me a, give me a break. I thought you were like a, I thought that's so what you told me, Daniel. Oh. What kind of teacher are you then? <laughs> I thought you said that. You don't say it, Plato. Come on, give me a break. Hey, thanks, Terry Shaw. I've never seen you type it in. Boy, man, did you see that? Uh, looks like Alex and uh, looks like um, Alex Murdoch and and his son were in a row that night. What row? Thanks, Terry Shaw. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna start looking up the most obscure words that have ever existed, um, and then, oh, the machete lady was. What, what type? Of, what type of teacher are you? <laughs> I always say row, pronounced like oh. I stubbed my toe. Huh? 
Ow? Oh, they say ow? My Brits always say row pronounced like ow. In an ow? What? <laughs> you guys are hilarious, man. I'm telling you. I'm gonna find, I'm gonna start look at uh, the the crazy the word that nobody ever uses again. It's gonna be some like last time it was used was Old English like 1475 or some shit. And I'm gonna start using it every day. And I'm gonna go. <laughs> you guys don't use that word anymore. Ooh, wow. Wiltering in their blood. Hey, thank you, Cali Gal Three again. Okay, I want you guys to be honest. Put a one in your regular day English when you're talking to people and you're referring to somebody's arguing that you say, yeah, I saw Bobby and Sue down the street. They were in a row. Okay, I mean, be honest too. Don't be like, well, great, this one time I... Look at, nobody does that. Oh, you do not, Daniel. I guarantee you do not either, Zaza. Let's see, Graham drinking a Diet Coke. <laughs> well, good for you. I, I, I'm going to drink a... Uh... Okay, well, if you live in England, maybe. It's row like wow. What? How does row sound like wow? <laughs> okay, if you're American, you don't do that, right? Okay, if you live in Australian England, you don't say row. Uh, oh, how, how come there's a W sound at the beginning of row in Australia? I don't get that part. Wow. You know, all right, we got no well. We got no well last night. How, wait, how do you say rocket? I went, I flew on a rocket. <laughs> hey, I threw a, I threw a walk at somebody. Oh, you mean one of those things you cook, uh, uh, Asian food with? No, I mean, uh, you know, like you guys say rock. It's a walk, though. Well, what do you call a walk, then? Well, we call a walk a rock. Well, that's amazing. Uh, that's, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. It sounds like wow, pow, now. What? <laughs> you guys are nuts, man. Wow, cow, row. <laughs> Just because you don't use it great doesn't mean it's common for everybody else. Well, you know, I read a lot, though, so, you know, you just don't see it. I can just tell you that. I mean, I read a lot of, uh, you know, you see me when I'm doing with newspapers.com. I mean, I, we get all the years, everything, and that's the first time I've ever read it in any article that we've ever read. Except the other 16 times I was like, what do they mean by row? Just kidding, that's never happened. Yeah, yeah, there we go. There we go, Daryl. That's a good one. Row. Just row. <laughs> Boom. You. Three word, three letter word for argument. Row. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so it's row, not row. But even though it's spelled exactly like row, right? But see, that's the thing. If it's in England, it would probably be... Well, let me ask you this. Is it just context? It's still spelled the same? Row and row? You just have to know what you're referring to? That's pretty good, though. All right, man. I'll take you guys' word for it. You guys say row every day. Man, I'm going to start using it every time now, though. And just just for the sole purpose of nobody knowing what the hell I'm talking about. God, those people were standing there in a row. Oh, you mean they were standing right behind each other? No, they were arguing, you dummy. Haven't you used row your whole life for arguing? No, I use row for standing in a line or something is lined up. Oh, I see. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's pretty funny. Anyway, thanks for the... New word. Uh, I've never heard it my entire life. Okay. I've heard row before, R O W. Yeah. Hey, so what kind of teacher are you, Daniel? I think I misheard you when you said that. 
And and you took a photograph, so I figured, ah, you're probably like a paradigm breaking. <laughs> That's right, Scout and Dude. I, we're all, every one of us who never uses that word, let's start using it a lot. Gray, I'm mad at you because we got in a row last night on your show. Hey, get it? That rhymes too. No, Gray, it's row, not show, row like show. You'd have to say shout to. Got it. Rose in the queue. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I knew that. that you're, that's what you, I thought. You told me something like that. Yeah. Sorry about it. I knew that, Danielle. I got sort of thrown off track there. You've told me that before. <laughs> so, how do you end up. Is, did your job that you do, is that how you ended up talking to that. Uh, that teacher that we were watching with the machete, machete lady. Is that from what you're currently doing? Like you might take pictures and use it as like a, you know, something. I thought fish eggs were caviar. Who said that? I mean, where, where are you referring? I know what caviar is, you know, you get it in... Uh, like sturgeon and different types of fish like that. Huh? I'm not going to pronounce it that way, Janelle. I'm not going to say rouch now. Yeah, like row, cow, uh, you know, those are already explained the, the way that's said over there, I guess. Yeah, roe is fish eggs, right? That doesn't mean caviar, though. Caviar is fish eggs that you eat. Caviar, I mean, roe is like a salmon. You can pull the roe out, the eggs a, a female would have laid, and you can actually fish with those, too. They're, it's not the same thing at all. Although, I guess you could say um, some roe is caviar, but not some fish eggs are caviar, but not all fish eggs are caviar or something. <laughs> uh. All right, anyways, can I, let me get back to this though. We were on Orange, Washington. This is the second person in the same evening in the same house here. Uh, slain servants, Monday morning, horrible butchery. Innumerable theories. Hold on a second. Innumerable theories, a great many clues, and four arrests. So forget the arrest parts. A sickening sight at the scene of the murder, four persons weltering in their blood, two of them dead and the other unconscious. One rallies and tells the truth. At an early hour yesterday morning, long before the average businessman or sprightly housekeeper were up and about report was flashing over the city that another murderous assault had been committed upon some black servants and that the dead and dying victims awaited the coming of officers to authenticate the truth of the rumor. The sequel proved its truth. At one o'clock yesterday morning, a telephone message was sent to Sergeant Shenville. I guess they did have telephone. Did they have telephones in 18 something? That's crazy. I mean, literally, like, <laughs> was sent to Sergeant Chenville at his home from the residence of Dr. W.A. Morris, saying an attempt at burglary had been made there and asking the officer to come at once. Are you guys ready to get back onto the story? With his bloodhounds and, and trace of marauders, Sergeant Chenville replied that his dogs were loose had not been chained up Sunday night. 20 minutes later, <clears throat> he received another telephone message sent in by ex-alderman Duff and repeated from the police station to come out at once that a murder had been committed in the neighborhood by Mr. Duff's residence. Mr. Duff states that he was awakened at about 1 a.m. by his mother 
saying there was something wrong over at Major Dunham's. Almost simultaneously, Major Dunham called from his premise to Mr. Duff to come over. Upon repairing uh, to his neighborhood residence, an investigation was at once commenced and a most horrible, ghastly, sickening sight rewarded the searchers. Close by Major Dunham's residence, number 2310 San Marco Street. Yeah, let's put that in there. Should be close to this last one. 2310 San Marco Street, Austin, Texas. Oh, so now we're way over here. Huh. What's sent? Uh, I'm not sure. That doesn't actually go to 23. I'll just put a pin there, though. Orange, Washington. One of these, uh, let's see, where are we at here? 2310. Right there. Uh, San Marco Street stands a small wooden shanty. In this house lived four for some time past as man and wife, two black people known as Gracie Vance and Orange Washington. Thank you, Cadillac. Thanks for the support, and if anybody else would uh, like to help support the channel out there, it'd be awesome. Got a small number of people tonight, but you know, bigger amounts, so I appreciate that. Let's see. Uh, one of these, Orange, Wa Orange Washington, was fouled, lying across, found lying across the bed almost dead with ghastly wounds in his head looking over the bloody prostate form of washington a woman was observed reclining upon her left elbow on a pallet on the floor apparently badly wounded mr duff walked around to the door discovered it was locked and returning to the window spoke to the woman and asked if she could unlock the door she answered in the affirmative, opened the door, and Mr. Duff entered, followed by Major Dunham. Uh, let's see. Upon questioning the woman as to what this all means, she at first replied, I don't know. The question was repeated when the woman felt her head and said, I don't know, I'm burning up. Further than this, uh, further than this, nothing was uh, farmed from her, maybe. Her name is Patsy Gibson. She has been employed as a cook at the residence of Dr. Graves and is said to have been spending the night at Gracie's as a visitor at this junction, the absence of Gracie. So that's one of the victims, Gracie here. So at this juncture, the absence of Gracie from her room was discovered and remarked by Major Dunham. An examination disclosed blood on the western window further on the same direction blood was seen on the fence and later after following a bloody trail some 75 yards from her home this person must have been really strong to do that from the murdered gracie was found just back of mr hotchkiss stable insensible Weltering in pools of blood, her head almost beaten into a jelly, but not not to get ahead of the story, nor to omit the most important victim of this tragedy, let us return to the residence of Major Dunham and pick up the thread as unwound by Lucinda Body. <laughs> oh man, this is going to be crazy. So this is the actual, there's a witness who saw this. Thank you, Lisa Valenzuela. This is this is crazy. 
Another guest of the so this is a witness that lived, Lucinda Body here. Another guest of the murdered couple. It appears she was the first to give the alarm, which awakened Mr. Duff and Major Dunham by jumping from the window after having been sandbagged. So a sandbag, like you get a bag that's full of sand and it's heavy and you pound somebody in the head with it. Is that what that is? You try to knock them out with it. She had been sleeping on the pallet with Patsy Gibson and was the only one to recognize the assaulting party. Oh boy, we're gonna get a description here. Okay, so that other lady must have lived too. He had struck her, she got up, lit a lamp, and she spoke to him saying, oh, oh, doc, don't do it, let's see. He had struck her, assaulting party. He had struck her, she got up, lit a lamp, and she spoke to him saying, oh, doc, don't do it. Like doctor, like, his reply was, God, yeah, you know, God damn you, don't look at me. Looking around the room, Lucinda saw what had been done, viewed the bloody scene, and again said, Oh, Doc, don't do it. His reply was, Again, don't look at me, and blew out the light. Soon after, she jumped out of the window and rushed towards Major Dunham, who by this time had come out of his house. That's all right, she's, she's the one that was saved by the guy with the gun. Right. Come out of the house and armed with a gun. Thank you for all you do. The right. girl, hey, thank you so much. Lori Will. And by the way, this is this this is an unsolved serial killer case. All right, just letting you know. It's pretty. You gotta admit, like this one's crazy because we get to hear everything. It's almost like you have the police reports. So what, why does she keep saying doc? Is that like what you would just say to somebody? Hey, doc, you know, like, hey, dude, or something. Is that what that is? I think that's what they would say back then, right? Like, hey, doc, what are you doing, man? <laughs> I don't know if that's right or not. But uh, Don't look at me. Blow out that light. So, let, me, let me type this in. Let me, I'll look it up. I don't know. No, but they're spelling it D-O-C-K. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know. Right, like Doc Holiday, you know, those kind of things. What's up, Doc? You know, and they're not a Doc, you know? Yeah, well, there goes the discerning light just typed it in. So, yeah, I don't know. I think it's just something like that. I was kind of thinking, whoa, is this, she notices? So soon after, she jumped out the window and rushed towards Major Dunham, who by this time had come out of his house armed with a gun. The girl threw her arms around Major Dunham saying, we are all killed. We are all killed. Doc, Wo Doc Woods did it. Oh, Doc Woods did it. Well, who the hell is that? Afterwards, this girl said to Mr. Duff that Doc Woods did it. She was placed in the room along with the now unconscious, now that sounds like a doctor, <laughs> I mean, unconscious Patsy Gibson and the dead Orange Washington and his so-called wife, Gracie Vance. Uh, let us leave them there and return to the alarms which led to the telephonic message which brought John Shinville on the field. Major D. Or Durnham says that sometime before 1 a.m. he was awakened by a noise. So back then the reporters could ask uh, the detective or whatever you know the whoever running the show there and they would just tell you everything that they saw there's no yeah we're gonna we need to hide some of this stuff you know we, we just feel like uh you know only the killer needs to know uh let's see so something about noise which he took to the orange 
Orange Whipping Gracie, an act that he had been frequently guilty of. So apparently there's been times... Oh, Jesus. Shoot, the light just came on over here. Oh, man. It's really bright in my face. And I don't know if it... Uh, you guys have to wait a second. Hey, whoa! What's going on, Cadillac? Jesus. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you. Very generous. However, he arose, went to the back door of his residence, and discerned that all was quiet. He returned to his bed. So they, uh, let me just go back to down here, it said. So they went and got Major Durham that sometime before 1 a.m. he was awoken by um, a noise. I think that's one of the people that lived there, which he took. You know, he thought it was orange whipping Gracie, an act that he had frequently was guilty of. However... He arose, went to the back door of his residence, and discerned that all was quiet. He returned to his bed and went to sleep. The noises he heard sounded like slapping one's full hand over a person's mouth. It must have been that, uh, it must have been that subsequently Lucinda's screams aroused Mr. Duff and caused her to awaken her son. It is equally probable that the same disturbance woke Major Dunham uh, be that as it may, <laughs> well, that's a phrase my mom uses, and some people still use that one. I, that one I can say, be that as it may, Mr. Duff responded to the first call of his neighbor, took a cursory glance at the surroundings, and then applying at the nearest, and then applying at the nearest telephone. Huh. So, hell, I didn't even know telephones were 1885. There was just, that's crazy. Maybe in the big cities they had it going on. He immediately returned to Major Dunham's residence and at once began vigorously to sift for bottom facts. In this, he was able, uh, ably secondly, uh, seconded by Major D. In 20 minutes after Sergeant Chenville got Duff's telephone, he was on the ground. In the meantime, other neighbors of Major Dunham had been around, had been aroused, and among those who came to his assistant was Mr. Oscar Hotchkiss, living with his parents just across the vacant block northward. Uh, while the parties seemed to be searching around Major Dunham's place for the missing Grace Vance, Mrs. W. H. Hotchkins hallowed from her second story a window like probably hollered right that someone was uh, in the rear of her stable just at this time major dunham was in his yard with him was mr duff the wounded girl was obstructing the major's movements by her frantic and semi-conscious efforts to protect herself john shenfield and officer connor mounted and mr hodgkins were outside mr duff at once jumped over the fence, pistol in hand, and just about that time, the wakeful, watchful eye of Mrs. Hotchkiss saw a person running westward from her stable, and she again exclaimed to the men, uh, there he runs! And then it says, towards uh, Blacktown, Mr. Duff and Officer Connor fired several shots at the fleeing murder, but without effect, for the time being, he had escaped, but Lucinda's body positive statement that Doc Woods did it was Doc Woods' doom. As soon as the facts of the killing reached Justice Von Rosenberg, he explained a jury and proceeded to hold an inquest owing to some misunderstanding between the coroner and the statesman, reported as to the hour the inquest would be made. And let's see. Not the reporter's fault. The gist of it, perhaps disconnected, 
disconnectedly told is given, it is, it is known that Lucinda Body's evidence fastens the crime on Doc Woods. Just before the taking of evidence was concluded, Justice Von Rosenberg left his office, was absent, but a moment returned and called the Major Dunham, who was at the time testifying. They retired together and were out, but a short time when they returned, Major Dunham spoke. Man, I wonder if they found a way to make this guy innocent and he was the killer the whole time. Um, I have been to the, the county jail and identify the prisoner just brought in to be Doc Woods, who had been on my premises frequently and who was mentioned by Lucinda Body as the man who committed the outrages. Shortly afterwards, a bundle of clothes among them a very bloody shirt was shown to the jury. These were taken off of Doc Woods after he had been in prison. <laughs> this guy sounds as guilty as hell. That settled it. After a brief consultation, the jury returned the following verdict. The verdicts, we, uh, we the jury of inquest over the remains of Gracie Vance, sometimes called Washington, believe that the deceased came to her death by injuries inflicted upon her person by some instrument in the hands of Doc Woods on the 28th day of September uh, 1885 between the hours of 1 to 2 o'clock a.m. Travis County, State of Texas. Um, when the statesman reporter reached the scene of the bloody tragedy, a scene met his view almost uh, beguiling description. Excited groups of men and women were knotted so closely around the little shanty where laid the dead and wounded that it was with difficulty he obtained a glimpse at the prostrate forms within. Later on, he was granted entrance and viewed the butchered man and woman fully. But a detailed description is best told by Dr. C.O. Weller, who was first called in, and it's as follows. Lacerated wound on in, in front right ear, incised wounds near corner of right eye, lacerated wound above and in front of right ear about one and a half inches long, and incised wound about an inch and a half long over the frontal bone two or three inches above the right eye and a little outward and size wound about three inches long about uh, partial and frontal bones and in size wound about one and a half inches long to the left of the left eye and one immediately above this an inch long i mean man that sounds like somebody was just going nuts in there in front of the left ear and incised or lacerated wound above the left ear an inch in width and two inches long, one slight incised wound on left ear and two small lacerated wounds of the right cheek. No fractures of the skull was discovered. Uh, Patsy Gibson wounds. One incised wound about three and a half or four inches long diagonally across the right frontal bone. The wound extending uh, to the bone, or I think that says that. The skull was fractured. Lucinda body's wounds. One lacerated wound over superior lateral portion of right par parietal bone with fracture of the skull. The wounds in the scalps extended to the fractured bone. She complained much of her neck, uh, but no wounds there were seen. Orange Washington wounds. An incised wound on top of the head, dividing the scalp to the bone. The wound extended from before back, before backwards, and the skull was fractured. The wound in the scalp connecting with the fractured bone. The third finger of his right hand was cut, probably a defensive wound, along his posterior surface. Beyond these, no other wounds were noticed. Dr. Graves concurred with Dr. Weller in his description of, this, of several wounds. Soon after, the officers were uh, possessed of the foregoing facts. They were 
distributed in various directions. The first arrest made was that of Oliver Townsend. Uh, looks like they arrested some other people. Okay, arrested Doc was in the cotton patch. His shoutly denied his guilt and said he could prove his innocence. Dr. Baird says Doc was on the place at 10 o'clock Sunday night and again at 4 o'clock Sunday morning, but it's only eight miles to where he was caught and his bloody garments tell a horrible tale. He claims that is the result of an old venereal disease. This remains to be proven. He was taken before... Man, that's a, you don't hear people use that excuse too often. Huh? Yeah, I've got all this blood all over me from an old venereal disease. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes, everybody. I'm the talk of the town here. Yeah, that's... Uh, he was taken before Lucinda's body, who identified him as the perpetrator. That's weird, though. I mean, come on, you got to admit, like, it's weird that she knew who he was, right? The wounded woman were taken to the hospital, and at last accounts, 3 o'clock this morning, there was some indication that Lucinda would pull through, but little hope is entertained of Patsy's recovery. The deceased man and woman were taken possession of by relatives and friends for decent internment. Yeah, man, that's definitely, so I don't know, but here's the thing. I mean, then there's two more murders, but interestingly, now that you, I think about it, the next two victims are white women, and maybe those two are somebody like a copycat, like a payback type of situation, because they feel like, um, I don't know, but anyway, the, the, the doc guy, he never, he got out later. So, I don't know, we'll have to see. Let's just see how similar they sound. All right, so so now here's another one. This is um, 19, 1885 Eula Phillips here. All right. Blood, blood, blood. I mean, they, you know, you got to admit they weren't sensationalistic at all back then <laughs> in their writings, you guys. I mean, they were, at least they were just totally just down the line, nothing sensationalistic, just hardcore titles just like they do you know they're much like the youtube channel oh wait they're exactly the same i mean i'm gonna start doing this i should have put this as my thumbnail right here blood 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 last night's horrible butchery i mean you know how many people would have showed up for that one man what do you guys think should i do that You guys are like an hour behind in your comments. It's weird. It's just some of you are way behind, and some of you are. I'm not doing it. I think that's like totally bogus crap. I'm not doing it, man. There's no way I'm doing that. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Cut to the next scene. Every clip is like massacre on Main Street. Oh, and just. You know, like in Gilligan's Island when he'd say, I'm not doing it. I'm not wearing a dress. I'm not wearing a dress. And the next scene, I'm, I'm not doing it. He's, now he's got a dress on. Remember that when Gilligan? Yeah. All right, here we go. Blood, blood, blood. Last night, horrible butchery. The demons have transferred their thirst for blood to white people. Oh, Whoa! Now it's way worse. That's what they're trying to imply there. Like it, you know, it was, it was, you know, we could accept it before when it was just the the black people, right? But uh, you know, now, ooh, that's, oh, isn't that just ridiculous? I mean, so that just shows you sort of like that bias that they had back then. It's ridiculous. It's just insane. Between eleven and twelve o'clock last night. While a reporter of the Statesman was engaged in conversation with City Marshal Lucy at Martin Shoe Store Corner, Private Watchman Wilkie came up very hurriedly and, speaking to Captain Lucy, said, A woman has been chopped. <laughs> Did he really say that? 
all the pieces down on East Water Street. Go down there. Instantly, Marshal Lucy and the reporter took the first carriage at hand and were driven quickly to 203 East Water Street. So you might not have that in um, Austin. So they have Water Lane now. Yeah, it's not going to... Hmm. Water... 203 Water Street. Yeah, that's not going to be it. But anyways, they probably don't have that there anymore. A uh, foul and bloody assault had been committed. The victim of this murderous, diabolical, hellish attack. I mean, I kind of like that writing style, though, because it makes you realize, wow, this is, you know, foul and bloody assault had been committed. The victim of this murderous, diabolical, hellish act is a white lady, the wife of Mr. Mr. M. H. Hancock, an elderly man and a mechanic. When the reporter entered the premises, he found doctors Burt and Graves dressing the ghastly wounds in the head of the unfortunate victim. The skull was fractured in two places and blood was oozing from both ears. Her, groin, her groans of agony were piercing and with what seemed to be her expiring death, her breath. Uh, cupfuls of blood were emitted from her mouth. The reporter questioned Mr. Hancock and from him, but a distracted, disconnected narration could be obtained. He said that his daughter had gone out to a Christmas Eve party somewhere in the neighborhood, and as they were not expected to be out late, the doors were left unlocked. Something woke, woke him up when he suddenly realized the fact that his house had been robbed. Feeling for his clothes, he discovered that his pants were gone. Getting up, he went to his wife's room in the east end of, of his humble cottage, which was lighted by the full glare of the moon. When he was almost uh, paralyzed, probably is what it meant to say, paralyzed by the sight of clots of blood, on the bed and his wife's nowhere to be seen. The room presented every appearance of a robbery having been committed. He went out at a uh, he went out and back out let's see. He went out at a back door and going to the rear of his premises, he saw his wife lying prone upon the ground. I think that's just like flat on your stomach. Uh, weltering in a pool of blood. Picking her up, he started back to the house, all the time calling on his neighbor, Mr. Persinger, for help. Obeying the distressing summons, Mr. Piercing, uh, Persinger hastily dressed himself, and crossing his own yard into that of Mr. Hancock, he saw the old man lying across a wooden walk uh, with uh, with his bleeding and mangled wife in his arms. Mr. Persinger assisted Mr. Hancock to carry the butchered wife. I mean, it's weird how every sentence they have to put another adjective in there. Uh, Mr. Persinger assisted Mr. Hancock to carry the butchered wife and mother into the parlor or sitting room, and in a few minutes afterwards, Dr. Burt arrived and was speedily followed by Dr. Graves, owing to the excited state of mind in which Marshal Lucy and the reporter found the people who had assembled in Mr. Hancock premises. It was almost next to impossible to collect anything. With a coolness and precision that denote the courageous officer, so it says light detailed da da data. That's weird, they use the word data back then? <laughs> Oh, that's, I mean, I mean, you know, I wouldn't think they would use the word data, you know. I don't know why. It seems like data is more like computer age stuff. 
With a coolness and precision that denote the courageous officer, Marshal Lucy gave his orders and he himself at once set about tracing the murderous villains. They always say that with an S, you know, but nobody's ever said they saw two people who had perpetrated the hellish deed. The city's bloodhounds were brought to the house and given a start in the direction in which Hancock said he saw the two men jump the fence. The dogs worked all all right for a short while, but not all satisfactory to the officer, Uncle Dick, who handled them when they were brought back and given another start. And when the reporter left the premises, they were apparently working well, taking a trail which led in a westerly direction or up the river. Yeah. That the purpose was robbery, says there can be little doubt, judging by the appearance of Mrs. Hancock's room, but why she should have been dragged nearly a hundred feet. See, that sounds just like the first ones, this dragging thing from her chambers where the assault was committed is somewhat puzzling. Perhaps the surgeon's examination will, will reveal the hellish purpose. The weapon used was an old ax. There we go again, an ax and the person's dragged from the house. <laughs> look, at, look at all you guys. <laughs> Goodbye, yeah, just, good night everybody. I need one of those glove fitting. I don't know what that means. Jesus, it's ridiculous. Um, let's see. Was an old axe, which was taken by Officer I. W. Johnson and is now at the police station. While still gathering notes, absolute, kneeling by the side of evidently dying lady, a shrill voice from the street cried to the reporter that another murder had been committed in the second ward on the premises of Mr. James Phillips. Quickly as possible, the reporter went there and ascertained the following particulars of the, uh, yeah, let's see, because of the murder of Mrs. Phillips. Terrible as was the murder, of Mrs. Hancock, a still more appalling horror awaited the police officers. Mr. James Phillips, architect and builder, well known in the early city, resides at number 3302 West Hickory Street, very near the heart of the city. Let's see what that is. Okay. Yeah, see now we're right back in here again. Somewhere around in this area, I guess. Uh, very near the heart of the city, the residence is a uh, let's see, is a four, is, oh, there up here, is four, uh, one, is a one-story frame with L extending to the south and towards Hickory Street. Between this L and the main building, which contains several rooms, there is sort of a platform or covered uh, veranda connecting the two wings. A small room in the L was occupied by Mr. Phillips, son of James Phillips, Jr. and his wife, Mrs. Ula Phillips. Last night, Mrs. Phillips and his wife had little um, and little child retired to bed as usual. Sometime past midnight, the household were awakened and their attention attracted by Mr. Phillips Jr. calling for someone, uh, calling for someone. The door of the room, which opened out on the covered veranda, was found open. On entering, Phillips was found. The pillows and bed clothes presented a horrid spectacle, being literally saturated with blood and the sheets reddened with gore. Phillips lay on his right. Uh, Phillips lay on his right side. It says, "So Eula, I guess, is uh, 
That's a male then, I guess. I thought, that was, I thought it was a female. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that maybe that's an error. Maybe it is a guy. I don't know. Isn't Eula a female name? No, let's see. So Mrs. Eula Phillips last night, Mr. Okay, so maybe I'm just reading it. Uh, I jumped the gun there. There is a sort of platform. A small room in the L was occupied by Mr. Phillips' son, James Phillips Jr., and his wife, Mrs. Oh, Mrs. Eula Phillips last night. Mr. Phillips and his wife and little child retired to bed as usual. Sometime past mid midnight, the household were awakened and their attention attracted by Mr. Phillips Jr. calling for someone. The door of the room, which opened out on the covered veranda, was found open. On entering, Phillips was found. Okay. The pillows and bed clothes presented a horrid spectacle being literally saturated with blood and the sheets reddened with gore phillips lay on his right so maybe he survived with a deep wound just above the ear made with an axe which lay beside the bed mrs phillips was not there but her child remained all besmeared with blood but unharmed. Search was immediately instituted for the missing woman. A trail of blood still fresh on the floor of the outside veranda was followed out into the yard and in the northern part of the enclosure a few feet from the fence and the door of the water, uh, the water closet, Mrs. Phillips was found dead. So isn't that weird? This person always takes them out. Like, that's heavy, you know, you <laughs> were... This person must be incredibly strong. You know, I mean, just... He took one over a fence and different... I mean, that's almost impossible with somebody... Uh, lifeless body, the dead weight, doing something like that. Uh, the body was entirely nude and a piece of timber was laid across the bosom and arms and evidently used for the most hellish and damnable of purposes. Oh boy. The hands were outstretched and a great pool of blood still warm and scarcely coagulated stood in a little trench into which the life current had flowed down from the unfortunate victim. The body had been dragged from the room, but whether Mrs. Phillips was killed in the room or as the elder Mr. Phillips thinks, she was awakened by the assault on her husband See, this is just like uh, like Zena and um, and Ethan, right? So I, I actually, you can make a good comparison here, as how Brian Koberger. Almost every one of these murders has multiple people that this person attacked and rendered, uh, you know, useless basically, and then he killed many of them too. So I think that's something to consider, and I keep trying to tell people that in the Koberger case where people are sleeping, he goes in, he does these attacks, and um, he's able to do it because they were sleeping. And people are kind of out of it. You know, maybe Zena and Ethan were still sort of awake, though. We don't really know. But you can see this guy did it every single time, and he got away with it. No, they, they never caught this guy. The body had been dragged from the room, but whether Mrs. Phillips was killed in the room or, as the elder Mr. Phillips thinks, she was awakened by the assault on her husband and attempts attempted to escape cannot be determined. It is believed, however, that the assassins stifled her voice and that she was still alive when dragged into the yard where she was outraged, so she was sexually assaulted, and then the last and fatal blow delivered. The position of the body indicated that the devilish act was perpetrated by the assistance of a second party as both hands were held down by pieces of wood in which, uh, which position the fiends left their victim and in which she must have died. The elder Phillips stated that while this most horrible crime was being committed, everything was as silent as usual. No outcry seems to have been heard no skillfully so skillfully did the inhumane butcher or butchers carry out a crime worthy of the imps of hell phillips 
The wounded man was seen a short time after this awful and infernal crime. A physician was present and had given him a soothing potion, but stated he had not investigated the wound and could not say whether the skull was fractured or not. When asked if he knew who struck him, Mr. Phillips deeply groaned and said he did not. It is believed his wound is serious, if not fatal. The wound of his head, the wound of his dead wife was also in the head and evidently with the same axe which he had been struck at the later hour at which this is written, it is impossible to give the full details of this appalling assassination. Wow, so there you go. That's uh, Eula, and I think there's a picture of her, so. Yeah, so here's Eula Phillips, right there. Hold on, I got it. This is a the other victim. Yeah. Well, I had the other picture, but now I can't find it, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm doing the move on to the next one. So the next victim is December thirtieth. And this is Susan Hancock, it's 1985. But isn't it weird that the original was December 30th of April of, of uh, 1984. So it's December 30th, 1984. And the last killing is December 30th, 1985. There's no way that that's a coincidence. I mean, that is just so, like, just boom. Exactly one year later. So here is Susan Another one, the eighth victim. See, this is the eighth one. The inquest not concluded. So the eighth victim, rural of Mrs. Hancock yesterday afternoon. The inquest not concluded. Other points in the case. Well, this article's on, so it was yesterday, so it was the 29th. And I think the other one was, didn't we come up with? I can't remember if it was the 29th or 30th. The funeral of Mrs. M.H. Hancock took place at 5 o'clock yesterday afternoon from her late residence of East Water Street. Detained as a witness before the jury of inquest was prevented from being present at the interment of his murdered wife. December 29, 1985, on the, so I guess it's the 29th, on the 28th and 9 o'clock p.m., on the 28th something, inst, at 9 o'clock p.m., in the city of Austin, at about two and one half hours after death, we held an autopsy of the body of Mrs. Susan Hancock. The examination developed three wounds on her head as follows. One cut cutting through the upper part of the left ear, through the soft tissue and fracturing the squamous portion of the left temporal bone for about one inch. One wound about one inch above and to the left of the left eye making an external wound about one and one half inches long in a horizontal direction. Uh, let me, I gotta go, I wanna find the one that talks about the, uh, hold on. I'm gonna look at this again, newspapers.com. Susan Hancock. This would be December 1885, Austin, Texas. So that's the same one, right? about the 31st. <laughs>
Yeah, it looks like the same article there. The wound penetrated the... Okay, we're down here. Um, tearing the membrane and brain. And involving mostly the middle lobe of the left... I mean, isn't it amazing they have this stuff in the papers? <laughs> isn't that amazing? What am I so mean about? What did I do this time? You don't use so mean when I'm mean. I didn't do anything. The brain for two or more inches around the fractured was filled with clotted blood in a state of partial decomposition. The other wound was in the right ear and done by a sharp pointed instrument. So when was she actually killed though? Following for December in the city of Austin in about two and one half hours after death. Okay. Is this part of the story or does it go over here? The sailor turned away and picked up a rock and walked down the saloon determined to hurl it through. I think that might be different. I want to get this, uh, this story though. Let's see, in the presence of death were a newly married couple, entire strangers to Mr. Hancock and his daughters who dropped into the house to tender their services, their being uh, her mother's death. Hmm. I don't know, this one doesn't really go through the description here. But man, same kind of situation it sounds like with the axe chopping through the head. I'd like to know what the story was behind that though. All right, I'm gonna move on to the night. There's 1986 here, a reward. So this is where, uh, this kind of shit, you could, this could never happen now, even though there's still disparities in reward funds. But look at, look at how this is worded here, watch this. So this shows that, I mean, just total racism bias stuff that was going on back then. A reward of $1,000 will be paid upon the arrest and conviction of the party or parties who upon the night of December 24th, 1985 in the city murdered Mrs. Eula Phillips. A second reward of 1000 will be paid upon the arrest. I mean, $1,000 back then is like, God, I mean, that's a huge amount of money. Paid upon the arrest and conviction of the party or parties who upon the night of December 24th, 1985 in the city murdered Mrs. H. Hancock. So those are the two white women, right? Now look at this. Third, a reward of $1,000 will be paid upon the arrest and conviction of the perpetrator or perpetrators first convicted of any of the following crimes. So, I mean... I guess all of them are a thousand too, but why did they single out like these two getting their own paragraph and then all of the six black people down here, they're just part of like one paragraph as if they're somehow it's all they're just, you know, the same. I think that's pretty, I don't know, I don't, it sucks. <laughs> Let's see. Austin, Texas, March 8th. Evidences began to strengthen the belief about the citizens that murder of Mrs. Blanton belongs to. And it was, uh, yeah, so there was this other guy that was arrested. And, um, you know, eventually he got off too. I was just going to read the, there's this little article here in Texas Genealogy right here where it says, Travis County, Texas, serial murders, 84 to 85. There occurred a number of murders which were generally considered to have been committed by one individual, making it one of the first known serial killers in the U.S. The case is known today as the servant girl murders. Since the victims are generally agreed to have been six African-American women working as servants in Austin. So that was generally. But there's Molly Smith, Eliza Shelley, Irene Cross, Mary Ramey, Orange Washington, Grace Vance, and then it says, and 
two Caucasian ladies, both of whom were murdered on Christmas Eve, 1885. So they were both murdered that same night. Both husbands of the Caucasian victims were arrested and tried, with James Phillips being convicted of the crime of killing his wife. Mrs. Hancock's husband was found to be not guilty, and James Phillips' conviction was later overturned, largely based on the testimony of Sheriff Hornsby, who gave the juries another suspect to consider, a black American, Nathan Elgin, who was a cook at, in the Simon Hotel central location to all the murders. He was also missing a toe on his foot, which matched a bloody footprint found on the murder site of Mary Ramey. Mr. Elgin died in early 1886 after being shot while beating a woman in a bar. No one else was ever put on trial for the murders of the servant girls, and the crimes are unsolved to this day. We've compiled here the various news stories of the Times, which reported on these killings. Well, we, we already just went through those, but the link's in the description if you want to go check those out. So anyways, what do you guys think of that? <laughs> Was that just crazy? It's, that's so obviously, at least the first six were the same person. I mean, I thought it was weird that they had the doctor, you know, the doc. And that person recognized them. And then there was two more killings, but then all of a sudden, they race chain, you know, went to two white people after that guy was arrested. So were those people taking advantage of that? I mean, they, surely they would have known that it wouldn't be a pattern now because the doc was arrested already or was it somebody taking revenge like uh, maybe in this case a black person killed the two white people uh, but we don't even know I think they the first witnesses said a white person killed the um, was what was the killer of some of the black people right so I don't know man. That, that's a weird one but definitely a serial killer I mean this person broke into people's homes smashed them in the heads with the sandbag and then use an a after they were kind of like out of it would hit him with an axe and then with with the target that he had he would take the woman like out a window when they're all bloody and even it sounds like he even assaulted them sexually after they were dead in some instances so this guy is one of those you know the psycho serial killers that we have in the world today even so Anyways, I thought you guys would be interested in that, <laughs> even though it was 1885, all right? All right. And that's going to be it, you guys. That is going to do it. <laughs> By the way, I'm going to... I mean, if I spin tonight, somebody's got a good chance of winning here. I think there's only like eight people. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe ten. So I'll definitely do that. Okay, just looking, doesn't look like there's any PayPal's or anything. You sent one and I don't see it. Sorry about that. And thanks for the, everybody sending in super chats that, that did, I appreciate it. Every time I read, it gets really slow in that uh, realm. I just got really lucky tonight. So thanks for uh, getting being lucky with the generous freaks. Here we go. This is going to be for a notebook. Who the hell knows? Oh, God. Kelly Gal 3 wins like every single day. I, I, <laughs> you want another one or... Well, oh, well, you get, well, Mag, why didn't you make it to the spin? Thanks, Revengeance. 
Man, I, I'm gonna go. I, those kind of stories are just so awesome for me, man. I, I love them. I don't know why. Kind of felt old school though. It was kind of neat to. Remember we did the one in Cleveland with the two girls that were just kind of there and. Yeah, God, it was like, God, it seemed like it was 1920 something or 30. They were in that hotel and they just got one. The one girl got murdered savagely by somebody. They were chasing him around in the hotel. Yeah, thank you very much, Mag. And revengeance. I'll tell you what, I'll do another spin with you guys in there. Here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. We'll do one more notebook spin. Oh, look at that. Cadillac wins a notebook. So Cadillac, make sure to send me your address. We'll get you a notebook, all right? Boom. Thank you. Ah, I just threw it in there. I just did a spin. At least you got a shot, Revengeance. At least you had a shot. Yeah, that cat is pretty cool. Da -na 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 -na. Yeah. Man, that's wild. I wish there was um, images of what on the ground there. I mean, I, I went and found Austin images from 18-something. It doesn't look anything like it. Obviously, there wasn't skyscrapers and whatnot in 18-something, but... Uh, I'm sure there was mainly homes and a few stores and saloons and things like that. Probably way less people, obviously. Um, but that's just brutal. Serial killer on the prowl 140 years ago. Where's my trigger bunny? Oh yeah. I feel triggered by that story, don't you guys? A little bit, a little bit. It's pretty funny during the Arius trial. I have them jumping around on their their heads and everything. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. I don't know, they arrested Doc Woods, Susan. They arrested him. Yeah, what happened to him now? He must have been freed at some point. Flying up there. Thank you to Lisa Murphy. Crime free. Oh, it disappeared. Lisa Murphy, crime free. Uh, Colleen, Daily Page, Cadillac, K Me. Is this from earlier in the day or is this right now? Yeah, Scouting Dude. Yeah, Je Jessica Schubach, Vanessa Dance, Scouting Dude. Caligate, Gal 3, Eugenie, Annie T, Music Maker, Terry Shaw, Lisa Valenzuela, Lori Will, Revengeance, 
Mag, and new members are Dobby Smith, Nana B, RLL, and Christy Girl 949. Woo! Here, I gotta get something worked out over here. This will be this will be pretty funny. I figured it out. Okay. Well, hey, anyways, thanks everybody for being here tonight, and uh, I really appreciate you guys' support. We're building up to have a pretty good last night uh, of the month here and uh, you know just getting back on track here everybody just getting back on track all right and thanks for putting up with me during my basically a stressful year you know so <laughs> pretty stressful year it seems to be getting back on track now and uh, you know thank you Yeah, if you have any uh, case ideas, if you send me case ideas, don't do research or you know, you know, you just go here, great, here's the name and here's the city, and the year and good night. You know, you know, I don't want 15 articles and links because, you know, I like to. That's the part that's sort of fun for me. You know, to go find the stuff. I don't go listen to other people's podcasts or anything like that. So. It's going to be my ideas and thoughts on a case when I'm going through it. And sure, uh, because I don't do that, I might miss some thing that somebody else had or whatever. But it's just the way I do it. All right. So thank you guys for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. Oh, wait. I was actually talking to you with this screen, but it hadn't transitioned it over yet. <laughs> I thought I was look you guys were looking at me. But, uh, yeah, we'll see you guys tomorrow, all right? Uh, I think we have Jody Arias, day number 37 in the day. And um, actually, tomorrow night, I think I'm going to cover for sure the disappearance of Mark Heimbaugh. Uh, I've got that one. That's 1991. So we've got that one. I was going to try to do it tonight, but it, I knew this one was going to take a while, so I didn't mention it. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you all, and we'll see you tomorrow. As I always say, until next time, don't have a bill. Be safe out there. And here's the new. Here, watch this. Yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing for quite a while now. And during this whole time, I have not seen one It's almost the same one. Look at it. That is a crime dissector. Like rejecta. I'm a certified human lie detector. Gonna get ya. On a stretcher, if you try and play me like an old projector, crime sector is my nectar. Professor Gray is gonna give another lecture. Crime collector, freak connector, and I'm always gonna be a pup protector, fool deflector, interceptor, and I'm meaner than a specter with a vector on his pector. With all respect, ya, just remember I've a temple for conjecture. I have no agenda. I'm the pretender, and I'll serve it to you straight without the blender. And in the end, I'm gonna send ya on a mission to reveal the true offender. Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work. All right, everybody. <laughs> All right. Hey, Gray, that was pretty cool with the bunny and everything. You know, I like it when it says a. Would you just? <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody. <laughs> Thanks again. We got the trigger bunny at the end dancing with with Lori, you know, Lori Daybell. Uh, she just happens to be you know, a 3D character that's out there. Okay. Again, thank you all so much, and we'll see you tomorrow, and be safe out there. Good night, everybody. Jay. Very good, Mary Lou. Thanks, Gray. No problem. <laughs>